From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're Inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now at the NYSE and at ISIS exchanges and clearinghouses around the world. And now welcome, Inside the Ice House. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. Over our 300 episodes, we've offered our audience an array of perspectives on major topics shaping global markets. In an episode last year with Admiral James Stavridis about his book of predictive fiction, 2034, a novel of the next world war, we discussed the potential flare-up of economic and political disputes between the U.S. and China, leading to a real actual hot war. Now, it hasn't come to pass yet, but in the years since that conversation, the global stage has seen several turns that have evolved the situation between East and West. We've talked about several of those turns, including the environmental commitments made at COP26, evolution of the pandemic, and of course, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. The military capability of that perennial Cold War rival came up in my conversation with Admiral Stavridis. In his book, Putin is still running an expanded Russia, which finds a way to join the global conflict taking place on the pages. And in discussing the current state of Russia, the Admiral told me, accurately and clairvoyantly that I'm going to quote here, the Russian military is sort of ghettos and penthouses. Much of the Russian military is conscript driven. It's old equipment. It's outdated tactics in many ways, but there's a few penthouses. The penthouses are their submarine force, which is highly capable, and their offensive cyber, which is very, very good. And that's what Admiral Stavridis told me. Now, a subplot of the ongoing conflict and the resulting global response is how China is reacting to Russia's aggression. The two nations have a complicated history, of course, as both allies and rivals. China's economic growth has long surpassed its Western neighbor. And the way Xi Jinping has expanded his country's power sits in stark contrast to Putin's playbook. Which brings us to our guest today, James Falk. A leading expert on market structure, he played a central role in the internationalization of the Chinese capital markets while working at Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing. He recently spoke to the New York Stock Exchange's Vice Chairman John Tuttle on how China's growth and ambitions have and will continue to shape global markets. And of course, we wanted to follow up with the pod as soon as John told us about that conversation. So coming up right after this. And now a word from On Holding, NYSC ticker O-N-O-N. Pause is essential. It's part of the process. Training doesn't end when my body stops moving. Recovery looks different for every athlete. We have different needs, different goals, different abilities. One thing we share, our bodies need time. Time to heal. The moment I stop training for the day, what people maybe don't realize is that the training is still going on. In a way, the training never ends. The journey just starts again. Pause is sanctuary. Familiar spaces and comforting routines. It clears your mind and rebuilds your body. Let the healing begin. Time to reset. There's power in pause. Our guest today, James Falk, is the author of Financial Cold War, a view of Sino-U.S. relations from the financial markets. James has written and spoken extensively about market structure issues and the intersection between geopolitics and international finance. Previously, James was a senior executive at Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing and sits on the board of several financial institutions. James began his career in investment banking, specializing specializing in the financial services sector. Welcome, James, inside the Ice House. Thank you very much for having me, Josh. I guess it's about 7.30 in the morning there. When does your workday start? 
I've got young kids, so I, I've got into the habit of getting up very early before they start milling about the house so I can get a few hours of useful, productive reading and work done before they get up. Have you been burdened by the Hong, Hong Kong's crackdown on COVID and the way that a lot of Westerners' lifestyle has been affected? We've been under quite heavy restrictions. The schools were closed. Most people were working from home and most of the restaurants were shut. We, we are relatively fortunate in that we, we have a little bit more space than most people typically have in these Hong Kong homes, but you know, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't great. The term Cold War, as we were talking about in the introduction, brings to mind a combination of military, political, and also financial arenas where the USSR, the United States, and more recently China competed for the, in, during the latter half of the last century. How does a financial Cold War differ from this definition? Well, first of all, I mean, actually, most people, when you use this term financial Cold War, they immediately jump to the idea of sanctions, trade wars, and so forth. But by the time you get to that point, I would say that you're already in a financial hot war. The, the financial Cold War is the much slower underlying factors embedded in national financial policy and the structure of the global financial system, which have been driving the, the two countries towards conflict. And the main driver of that is actually respectively the increase in wealth and income disparities in both countries, which unfortunately, neither side's leaders have really under really taking the steps to address the underlying root causes of. I mean, talking about seeing the perspective from the other side, James, your Chinese grandfather used to say that Eurasians have two brains. So I'm curious, how does your dual upbringing help you bridge these two audiences and shape your understanding of the issues? I think growing up in two different cultures and two different languages, you just instinctively pick up a lot of the unspoken and unwritten characteristics of a particular society and a particular culture. Those societies and cultures tend to have their embedded biases and you, you, you feel all of those. I mean, I'm not saying that, that they're necessarily good or bad, but you, you, you feel instinctively all the same feelings as both sides individually are, are feeling in their interactions with each other. I mean, sometimes it, it makes for a, a huge amount of internal conflict if you articulate each other. And it's certainly a recipe for a certain amount of schizophrenia, I think. But uh, I think it, it really helps you to understand on a, a really instinctive level what, what the underlying issues are. So outside of the Falk household, then, I mean, the, the roots of the U.S.-China rivalry go back really decades. But And you've had this front row seat really in the past decade to the evolution of both nations' financial markets. How did you actually become involved in markets in Europe and how did your career progress from there? You know, I had a very typical Hong Kong upbringing. I, I went to school here and then got chucked off to boarding school in the UK. I eventually got quite bored of being in the UK and uh, got, went to study as an undergraduate in Beijing, then ended up in London and started working in, in JP Morgan as a graduate trainee. And so spent years working in Europe, uh, including several years in, in Russia and the former Soviet republics. And then my wife and I decided that we were going to move back to Hong Kong in 2008, kept working in banking for a little while. And then suddenly the, the Hong Kong Exchange came along and said, hey, we're, we're looking at this deal in London. Can you come and help? And it, it turned out to be a London Metal Exchange acquisition. Uh, I went into that deal thinking, honestly, that the Hong Kong Exchange didn't have a prayer in winning that, ICE was what, one of the leading contenders sure. at the time, and CME, and they were vastly more experienced in international m and than the Hong Kong Exchange Group. But uh, somehow we, we managed to come out of that, the, the winner, and 
I, I was asked towards the end of that process to stay on to work as uh, Charles D's chief of staff. And so that then started a, a 10 year career a roller coaster ride, really, that um, took us through all the things that the Hong Kong Exchange Group achieved during that time. I've seen Charles several times speak uh, at the Futures Industry Association gatherings in Boca Raton and Chicago. You told the Essential podcast that in many ways, the idea of the book came out of a conversation you had with a gentleman named Fu Hao at the Shanghai Stock Exchange. What brought you both together and how did you shape your understanding of the disconnect between, I guess what I'll quote, the international market pra- practice and the Shanghai Stock Exchange? Well, Fu Hao ran and, and still runs the in- international business development division of the Shanghai Stock Exchange. And I, I, by that time, was running group strategy for Hong Kong Exchange. So he was my opposite number. And during the, the negotiations to establish what became the, the Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect program. <laughs> you know, we, we had we, we had a lot of interaction uh, around the, the various kind of minutiae of implementation. There are a lot of kind of differences in, in the way that the Hong Kong market works versus the Shanghai market. And we had to find a way for, or we had to agree certain parameters under which the, the Stock Connect scheme would work. And so it, it it happened that you know that there was a point at which we, we came to disagree on something and I I was kind of frustrated with him because I, I thought that he wasn't agreeing with hmm. what he wanted to do simply because he didn't understand. And you know, he, he he asked me the question, well, wh- why why do we why do you think it should be done your way? And I said, well, this is the way that it's done all over the world. This is international market mm. practice. And he turned around to me and said, but why? The penny suddenly dropped. And I, I realized it wasn't that he didn't understand or they hadn't looked at it. It was that he would looked at it in the past and he didn't agree. And I, I unfortunately, uh, I, I'm ashamed to say that I hadn't done my homework to really understand how that the mainland Chinese market operated. And so, and I certainly couldn't explain why international practice was as it was, but for the fact that it, it just was that way. So it, it, it drove me certainly uh, out of a sense of embarrassment to do a lot more work to try and understand why the, the Chinese market structure had come about as it was. How then did that contribute to what we see now, tensions between the US and China? If you step back first over the last 40 years, China has come leaps and bounds in in terms of its economic development and provided a huge uplift in the standard of living for hundreds of millions of people. But through that process, it has inevitably seen a widening of wealth and income disparities. But in terms of the transformation in capital markets, it is hard to understate the the transformation of the last 10 years. One of the most stark ways of looking at this is that if you remember back to the late 90s when you had the Asian financial crisis, China really glided through that compared with its Asian neighbors, largely because it had no capital markets interaction whatsoever. So, you know, if, if most of the investment in China at that time was through foreign direct investment, and just as the markets were tanking, doesn't mean that Volkswagen or General Motors are going to pull their, their plants. That was largely the same case during the global financial crisis in 2008. Over the last 10 years, through the introduction of the Stock and Bond Connect schemes, and particularly the inclusion of Chinese securities into some of the major global benchmark and indices such as MSCI emerging markets, the amount of foreign 
investment in China's capital markets has ballooned. And, and actually, a, a, a particularly um, stark statistic to look at is that in 2011, foreign liquid securities investments as a percentage of China's foreign exchange reserves stood at 14%. That number now stands at over 60%. So China's capital markets, although the, the, the proportion of foreign investment of, in them is still relatively low by international standards, China's capital markets are now highly integrated into the rest of the world. And so any dislocation in international markets, and, and particularly U.S. monetary policy is likely to have an exponential effect on China and the Chinese economy in a way that China has not experienced in the past, and in many ways, vice versa. China, Chinese markets will now start impacting the, the U.S., the U.S. economy, and U.S. livelihoods in a much more profound way than they ever have done in the past. So we've been talking about the relationship between China and the U.S. Let's let's add a little uh, twist to that. I mean, certainly finances play a role in all the ongoing issues between Russia and the rest of the world. What has been the impact on the Chinese markets, not just from its neighbors' hostilities, but, uh, but how the world has brought its economic might to bear on Putin? The, the Chinese leadership are in a very difficult position o over Russia and in many ways are conflicted within themselves in that Ch China has a very long established principle of non-interference in the affairs and the sovereign territory of other countries. So the military aggression in Ukraine certainly is something which is abhorrent to China and the Chinese on that on on that score. Now, nevertheless, there is a certain amount of sympathy with Russia's sensitivities around its border security, and particularly that the sensitivities that uh, the Russian leadership have about the expansion of NATO right up to their borders. The, the Chinese leadership can't afford to throw Russia under the bus, largely because th there are huge interdependencies. China shares a 2,600-mile land border with Russia. Russia is absolutely critical to the security and stability of a number of Central Asian countries on China's western borders. But more, more pertinently, in the past decades or, or more recent years, China has come to depend more and more on Russia as a source of energy and of food. In, in these two commodities, China is not self-sufficient and it has to import those from outside. Historically, it's imported them from places that ship them via sea routes that pass through the, the Malacca Strait, that, that narrow strip of water. And uh, unfortunately, as geopolitical tensions with the, the US have risen, China and Chinese, the Chinese leadership have become quite nervous about the, the potential chokehold that, that the U.S. Navy has over that uh, strip of water. And so it has forced them to diversify their sources of supply of food and energy, and that, that's made them much more dependent on Russia than in the past. They, they also have huge dependencies on the United States and particularly the dollar system, they certainly don't want to attract U.S. sanctions on them by doing anything that offends the U.S. So they are right now walking an extremely fine tightrope. 
What do most people not understand about currency issues and the role that the United States plays in it? Well, very, very simply, that it takes two to tango. The fact is that the, the US dollar system that was put in place after the Second World War has had a huge number of benefits to, to the whole world because it's provided a, a common unit or common language that has facilitated international trade and investment as we've seen it grow. But for, for the United States, it, it's created a huge number of headaches because in order to support the, the growth in trade and investment around the world, the, the US has had to continually supply dollars to the rest of the world. And that was all well and good while the US economy was growing at least as fast as the rest of the world. For, for many years now, through catch-up and, and the, the, their own technological advances, other countries have been growing quite a lot faster. And what that has meant is that, that the US is having to enter into ever more precarious levels of debt in order to support the US dollar's international utility role. Another factor of it is that demand for the US dollars in international trade and investment has led to a structural overvaluation of the dollar, mm. which, depending on where you sit in US society, uh, has hit you differently. If you happen to be the, the wealthy shareholder of a large US corporation that's been able to take advantage of that overvaluation and outsource production to places where you've had undervalued currencies, You've managed to lower your costs, increase your profit margins, the share price has gone up, and you've done very well out of it. If, on the other hand, over the last 40 years, you've been a US manufacturing worker, your experience has not been so rosy. It's been one of displacement, job loss, at best, long-term wage stagnation. And ultimately, this is a policy choice on behalf of the on the part of the United States. The, the fact is that the, the, the dollar has been a, a remarkably useful thing for the whole world. But for, for the United States, it, it's been a mixed blessing. It's allowed the US to uh, consume a lot more than it otherwise may have been able to, but that's come at, at the cost of a, a now very large segment of US society and, and made their lives and livelihoods far more precarious than, than they had been in the past. And so in, in that sense, I would say that although for a long time China did deliberately hold down the, the value of its currency. That was certainly the case between 1995 and 2005. It's not necessarily the case that the renminbi is overvalued, certainly relative to other major currencies like the, the yen or, or the, the euro, but that the, the dollar has not been allowed to structurally weaken because you, you've had this underlying demand in international trade and investment that, that's not allowed the US economy to readjust as it might have done to new economic realities. How has that affected the growing middle class in China? Well, I mean, the, the middle class in China actually faces many of the, the same issues. So during, during the early stages of reform and opening up, China issued uh, large amounts of borrowing from the rest of the world, which at that time was the, the typical emerging markets development pattern. And, and instead, what they did was that they harnessed the, the savings of the, the baby boom generation in China through their control over the, the state-owned banking system and channeled the, those savings into investment in Chinese infrastructure and other development priorities, that that necessarily required China to use policies that held down Chinese consumption. And so, you know, as, as China's middle class was, was developing and growing, they, they tended to save more and, and spend less than 
middle classes in other countries. What, what you've seen now is that China is now making a very conscious shift to put a greater uh, amount of spending power in the pockets of the, the Chinese consumer. And that, that's beginning to, to transform. But you know, at the same time, you know, all the same kind of technological and other disruptions have been going on in, in China. You, you've seen China is the largest user of industrial robots. You, you've seen a huge amount of automation happening in uh, Chinese manufacturing. And so you know, many of the same things that are happening to US manufacturing workers are, are now the experience of Chinese manufacturing workers. And at the same time, the, the middle classes are, are being squeezed because you know, urban housing has become extremely expensive relative to incomes. Part of the part of the underdevelopment of China's domestic capital markets has been manifested in a, a huge flood of capital into the, the, the limited investment classes that exist. And, and primary amongst those is residential property. And so it is becoming tougher for young Chinese and, and Chinese middle classes to, to get on the housing ladder. And you know, wages are, are not going up in the way that they, they were in the past. And you know, you're, you're starting to see the outsourcing of low-end, low-skilled manufacturing jobs to lower-cost centers like Bangladesh, Cambodia, Vietnam. And so in many ways, the Chinese are experiencing many of the same issues as American workers. After the break, James Falk and I discuss the lessons he hopes readers are going to gain from his book and the future of the financial Cold War. That's coming up right after this. And now a word from Stellantis, NYSC ticker STLA. Their grandfather once crashed an auto show by driving through a plate glass window on purpose. Their father was the most awarded SUV ever. And their crazy uncle raced sports cars and won. And while the blood of their relatives still runs true, none of them can do what these can. Introducing the next generation of Jeep Grand Cherokee. Available in two row, three row, and four by E. The legacy lives on. Welcome back. Before the break, I was talking to James Falk, author of Financial Cold War, a view of Sino-US relations from the financial markets about James's career and the recent history of China's capital markets and economic ambitions. So James, you wrote about the need to combat inflation and quoted John Maynard Keynes. And I'm going to quote him here. There's no subtler, no surer means of overturning the existing basis of society than to debauch the currency. In your view, how have the central banks fared in walking the line of cutting debt without setting off unintended consequences? With a huge amount of difficulty, I think you know, we, we've we've unfortunately dug ourselves into uh, an extremely deep hole uh, over the last four decades, and uh, unfortunately, we, we are now going to face a massive hangover for a, a huge amount of monetary and fiscal irresponsibility, and the, the hangover, unfortunately. The, the main price of that is going to be paid by most likely our, our children's generation. You could choose austerity. And the, the fact is that that has been extremely unpopular and, and it's quite difficult to implement in democratic societies. But default, as we saw it in very stark circumstances in the Lehman Brothers uh, insolvency during the global financial crisis can have huge spillover effects into the, the, the real economy. I inflation is one means, but inflation falls very unevenly on different segments of the population and can have 
severe societal impacts. And so there are not really any great options. And the fact is that we we are so leveraged as a as a global economic system that any attempt to normalize monetary policy is inevitably going to result in an awful lot of pain. The, the fact is also that you know, th this financialization of the, the global economy has coincided with a, a huge acceleration in technological disruption, which, which in and of itself is something that was going to was always going to generate a huge amount of societal disruption. We are now seeing a, a level of disruption in society that is unprecedented. There is no historical precedent for the, the level of societal disruption that, that we're now experiencing. And inevitably, a lot of people are going to be scared, that they're going to be worried about them, themselves, the, the futures of their children. And that's generating a lot of anger. And unfortunately, that anger is it is looking for it is looking for an outlet and in that sense we now live in extremely dangerous times both domestically and and uh internationally and geopolitically given the societal disruptions that are looking for an outlet as you say james what role do taxes play in that conversation well glo globalization has uh, create a lot of challenges there in that as trade and investment around the world have, have globalised, all countries have wanted to attract investment to themselves. And, and one of the means of doing so is through setting lower rates of taxation. It, it, is, a, it, it is a simple fact that it's a lot easier to move capital than it is to move labour. And so the, the tendency has been for governments to set lower rates of, of taxation on capital earnings than on labour earnings. And this has driven some quite wacky tax systems in which the, the extremely wealthy pay far lower rates of tax than ordinary middle class workers, which, which has exacerbated the, the wealth and income divides that have opened up. Last year, I think 136 nations signed a global minimum tax rate deal and agreement that with recent inflation and other market unrest is already coming under pressure. What are your thoughts about that solution? It, it, it was certainly a necessary step, but the, the G7 agreement last year was really a, a baby step um, and a, an awful lot more needs to be done. Unfortunately, given that you know, the, these we, we now live in a, a globalized world, it, it's impossible for any one country to address this problem on their own. And it does require international coordination and cooperation. And, and unfortunately, given the geopolitical tensions that exist around the world, we, we don't seem to necessarily have the... the environment of trust and openness that uh, is required to achieve some of those uh, agreements. I've been very lucky to have been able to have conversations about my, my book and uh, about other thoughts with uh, some Chinese policymakers. And I think that there's, that there's a tendency to feel if you're sitting on one side that the, the other side is sitting there cooking up evil plans to, to try and mess you up or, 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 or screw you over. But the, the fact is that you know I, I come at this from I, I come at this from the perspective that you know I, I go and visit friends in 
Beijing. I, I talked with friends in Shanghai and, and friends in Hong Kong. And my, my wife's American, so you know, I, I do the same you know, in, in New York and in Boston and other places. And you know, many of the many of the conversations that we we have with our peers and, and contemporaries are pretty similar in 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 both countries. You know, you, you're you're worrying about your kids, the education, the cost of housing. You're getting your kids in into good schools. Um, you know, uh, avoiding some of the the pitfalls that kids can fall into. Um, you know, you, I, I, what I see is not the the differences, but the incredible similarities be, between the two. But you know, unfortunately, we we sit you know behind you know, uh, divided by a, a large ocean and divided by language and, and to an extent culture and it certainly hasn't helped over the past two and a bit years that there's been very little travel between china and the united states which i, I think has exacerbated the, the types of paranoia that are really quite unhelpful in the relationship because the reality is that i, I see Far more points of commonality than I see differences, but in the absence of real interaction, I think that both sides are sitting there imagining you know that, that the other side are, are there cooking up sort of dastardly plans uh, about each other. How much is it encouraged, and how accessible to the average Chinese citizen are? The capital markets and wealth creation and, and wealth growth. There are 160 million individual investor accounts in China, share trading accounts. So the, there are a huge number of participants in China's capital markets. But the, the fact is that most people who are participating are, are doing so with very, very small amounts of money and a very small proportion of their savings. 78% of urban household wealth in China is held in the form of residential real estate, mm. both as, as homes and as investment vehicles. That compares with around 35% in the United States. And the fact is that, that there, there hasn't been a lot of confidence in the, the Chinese capital markets because they've been structurally prone to booms and busts. And so many Chinese savers kind of look at the, the, the Chinese markets as, as a little bit of a casino. But there's obviously a, a huge kind of maturation process that, that the Chinese capital markets need to go through, and, and they are doing that. But in the meantime, the, the, lack, of, the, the, the lack of a viable um, set of alternative assets to invest in, China's second largest pool of savings sits in cash deposits at banks. As of the end of 2021, that stood at 35 trillion US dollars. This is the largest untapped capital pool in the world. And you have to look at the fact that China's got a very rapidly aging population. That aging population is going to put a huge amount of burden on the state. For reasons of helping themselves see themselves through a what will hopefully be a long and healthy retirement, Chinese savers need to get more of their savings into high yielding or higher returning assets. And the government needs to do the same because it, it needs to defray what, what is already going to be a very significant rise in social welfare spending needs. And that, that has been a major driver of many of the, the steps towards capital markets internationalization that Chinese policymakers have pursued, whether, that, whether it's through the, the direct access schemes or through schemes like Stock Connect and Bond Connect via Hong Kong. It is the, the desire to allow Chinese savers to put more of their 
savings into capital markets. The, the Chinese capital markets aren't big enough and deep enough to absorb that amount of capital with, without generating huge asset price bubbles. And so some of that capital has had to come out into international capital markets. The, the big challenge, of course, facing them now is that given the geopolitical tensions with the US and you know, the, the control that the US has over the infrastructure supporting international capital markets outside of China beyond Hong Kong, that there is a serious national financial security risk associated with further steps to internationalizing China's capital markets. Chinese policymakers don't want to see uh, Chinese citizens and Chinese businesses subjected to the same types of sanctions that, that the West has been able to level on Russia. And so we're, we're sitting, unfortunately, in this kind of rather self-defeating stalemate uh, at the moment because it would certainly be in the, the rest of the world's interest to tap into China's savings that could generate a huge amount of investment uh, around the, the rest of the world. And it's certainly in China's interest to get that savings out. The, the challenge now is finding a secure path that Chinese policy makers feel comfortable with and that that policymakers in other countries feel comfortable with. In the introduction, I spoke about Admiral James Tavridis' vision for 2034, the hot war between the United States and China, also involving India and Russia. Let's go from the hot war to the financial cold war. What do you think is the best and worst case scenario for 2034 of the financial cold war? The, the, the best case is that China, the US, and other major countries are, are able to set aside that their differences, sit down and really pursue a wholesale redesign of the, the global monetary system that will allow a gradual reduction in the imbalances that have been allowed to, to build up. It's unlikely that, that that will be addressed by 2034, but it's going to take decades, but hopefully they can set themselves on, on the path towards doing so. If they fail to do that, I think we, we now sit in quite a precarious point in markets because over the last 30, 40 years, you, you've seen a gradual levering up of the system, which has made monetary policymakers, central bankers, largely impotent and at the mercy of the financial markets. We've already passed through a number of points that you know, might have uh, resulted in a collapse of the dollar system, whether it's through the, the huge uh, amount of public borrowing that the US has taken on, the, the enormous uh, monetary stimulus and, and debasement of the currency that, that we've witnessed. Um, and you know, more, more recently, through you know, the, the weaponization of, of the dollar in, in um, international markets against strategic rivals, all, all of these all of these things are leading us at some point to a, a demise in the, the dollar-based global monetary system. Well. On that note, James, I hope you'll allow me to sort of hope for the best case rather than the worst case by 2034 and beyond. But thank you for giving us this glimpse into the future of U.S.-Sino relations and the financial Cold War. It's been a great conversation. Josh, thank you very much. Uh, let's all hope for the best. And that's our conversation for this week. Our guest was James Falk.
author of Financial Cold War, A View of Sino-U.S. Relations from the Financial Markets. The book's available wherever books are sold. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or a question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at ice.com or tweet at us at Icehouse Podcast. Our show is produced by Pete Ash with production assistance from Ken Abel and Ian Wolf. I'm Josh King, your host, signing off from the library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 